All right, so we have um, two last lectures in this whole course. We had, uh, the plan was to have 16, so we have 18 and 16 now. The 18 will be about metrics. I will tell you everything I know about measuring software design. So when we design software, we need to measure the design and decide whether it's good or not using metrics, not only subjectively, but objectively. So we'll be, have interesting conversations. And then on the, on the last one, we will have very, uh, you know, we will look into the future, you'll see what happens. So metrics, uh, we will talk about, first of all, I'll show you some metrics which will uh, help you measure the size and complexity of your software. Then we go for very interesting topic, very old, called coupling and cohesion. Probably you've heard about these terms. If you didn't, then definitely need to learn it. Then we'll talk about productivity, the productivity of software designers and software design, and then how we can measure that. They'll be very uh, much about management of us designers, and then again, books, venues, and I will suggest you some calls to action. Let's start with the size and complexity metrics. So software can be measured in size, the most obvious, the most uh, old mechanism of measuring software size is software lines of code, SLOC, S-L-O-C. This is the very uh, old metric, from probably the number one metric. I show you the output from the tool, which is called c -Lock. This is probably number one and the only, the main tool on the market right now. It's basically a, a script written in Perl. It's a large, large script written in Perl, which is on GitHub. You can easily install it, download it, and when you call it, like in this example, you say C lock, and then you give the, the directory to check. Then it basically goes through uh, all your files and print you that kind of a statistic. You can look at the statistic. If you see it, okay, you don't see it. Uh, for each language, it will show you two metrics, how many files you have. Well, uh, no, forget it. You will show you three numbers, how many lines of code you have, how many lines of comments you have, and how many lines, blank, blank lines, like empty lines you have. There's three, 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 three numbers. Basically, people pay attention to code lines. So in this particular case, this is a Java framework, which we developed for the last, uh, I think, maybe five years. We have 27,000 lines of code. 23,000 comments, 27 code, 23 comments, and we have uh, empty lines, 3.6 thousand. What does it tell us? I don't know. Is it good or, or, or is it a big project? Is it not? I can give you some numbers. Uh, a small project, in my opinion, is something below 5,000 from 5,000 lines of code. Depends on the language, of course, because in Java you will basically write more lines comparing to Ruby, for example. In Ruby you're going to write at least two times less lines to do the same as you do in Java, maybe sometimes even five times less lines. In some languages you're going to write more, but still some numbers can show you some, uh, some can give you some uh, taste about the project. If the project is up to 50,000, I would say it's mid-size. If the project goes over 50,000 lines of code, and we're talking about lines of code, not lines of text files or some supplementary files, I'm talking about really lines of code, like in this example, we have 27,000 lines of code, then if it goes over 50, I, in general, would recommend to break it into two projects. So large projects, in my opinion, which are over 50,000, like 100,000, 200,000, that become, they become unmaintainable. So it's hard to maintain a project which has 200,000 lines of Java code. That's basically something that you definitely need to break into pieces. But if you look at Linux kernel, there's C code, 16 million lines of code. Thanks to them, I, I, yeah, God bless them, how they understand it, it's their job, I don't know, but in my opinion, that, that, that large repository, I mean, repositories of that size, they have to be broken down into a hundred different repositories, and each repository has to have its own architect, its own continuous integration, its own continuous delivery, its own versioning, its own mechanism of everything, of code review and everything. So that, that, in that case, the code will be much higher quality. A very, uh, a very uh, famous quote, probably you heard about it, that Bill Gates said it many years ago. I forgot to put it on the slides. So Bill Gates said many years ago that measuring the progress of programming by lines of code is the same as measuring uh, the quality of an aircraft by the kilograms. So the larger the aircraft, probably the better is the aircraft. Obviously, it's, it's a joke. I mean, we do not measure the, 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 the quality or whatever of the aircraft or completeness by kilograms. We measure by something else. But I believe this is not really true about software development. 
So in software development, I think that numbers of lines of code actually do make sense and we may pay attention to them. I can explain you why. So let's say we have a team of programmers and this team of programmers produces some amount of lines of code and we tell them programmers, so whoever of you writes more lines of code is a, a better producer. The performance is higher. It may sound weird because you can say, okay, if you give me this metric, then I will just write some garbage just many, many, many lines of code, and in the end, I'll be the best producer. This is true if this repository doesn't have any quality control. So if we accept whatever you write, then yes, of course. You write your garbage, you put it in the repository, we just count by the end of the week who wrote the most, you wrote the most, that's the reward for you. But if we have quality control, if everything you write, you have to submit to us in a pull request, and two other people have to review this pull request, and all the unit tests have to pass, and all the static analyzers have to pass, then obviously not so much garbage will be, you know, will we'll get through. It will be difficult for you to, to uh, you know, to, to send through the garbage. And more to that, if you start making this garbage, then we will start paying extra attention to what you write. And all the people who review the code, they will be more skeptical about the stuff you write, and they will reject you more intensively. And in the end, you will, you will submit less lines of code. So measuring productivity by lines of code, I believe it's a good idea if the, quality of, if the quality of quality control is high. Let's put it this way. The quality of quality control. But in most projects, of course, the quality of quality control is very low. So that's why people say, no, 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 don't count lines of code. Don't count productivity. We'll get back to this subject uh, today about productivity. So people very often say, no, lines of code is a terrible metric. We don't touch it. But I believe... It's not true. Lines of code is a very good metric which indicates how fast you move. Uh, the second metric which uh, I introduced myself many years ago, maybe I don't know how many years ago, yeah, seven years ago, I call it hits of code. We have lines of code and I introduced hits of code. It's not entirely my idea because you know, something uh, like this was introduced uh, long before my title, which was called code churn, but code churn is like a larger uh, concept. It's basically, in general, how you look at the, um, the amount of changes people make to the source code. But hits of code is a very simple metric. You just go through Git history. We all commit to Git. So if you open your repository, you open your full history of all the changes you've made since the beginning of the project, and you count in each change, you count how many lines of code you touched. You wrote, you deleted, you wrote, you deleted. So in the end, you may have 100 lines of code. But in order to get to these 100 lines of code, you made a million commits. And in each commit, you changed 5, 10, 20, 1,000 different lines of code. So in order to get to 100 in the end, just 100 lines, you made a million hits of code. So each hit of code is the line you touched. So we're basically starting from the beginning of the project, we, we calculate how many lines you touched. I mean, how many times you touched the line. So, for example, on the first commit, you changed it, you added 50 lines. On the second commit, you deleted these 50 lines. So how big is your hits of code? 100. 50 plus, 50 deleted, 50 plus 50. So we count everything. Deleted, added, modified, everything. So you touched 550 lines, then you touched 50 again, then you touched 100 again, and so on and so forth. But in the end, you have zero lines of code in total because you added 50 and then you deleted 50. So your count of lines of code is zero, but your hits of code is 100. So I believe this hits of code is very good metric if you pay attention to it again, like you measure the productivity of programmers by hits of code. And this graph demonstrates you what's happening in, this is the real project which, I, uh, which we were working on. And look at the red line. The red line shows you lines of code. So people started using, starting writing more and more and more. Sometimes the line drops down a little bit because lines of code can go up and down. Sometimes you have like a thousand lines in your repository, then you delete something, then you have 800, then you again grow. So lines of code can go up and down, but hits of code, the green line, will always go up. Because when you delete, you still increment the hits of code. The more you work with the repository, the higher is your hits of code. It will never go down. So see what happened on this, uh, what was the date? It was somewhere in, uh, somewhere in July. So in July, we deleted a large part of the repository. I don't know for what reason. We probably deleted some code due to refactoring. But this drop only incremented the hits of code, but definitely decremented, uh, decreased the lines of code. So we can say, okay, now our repository is small. So if you look at the, at the repository at the moment, 
then you say, okay, it's a small repository. But if you look at the history, you will say that in order to get to this small repository, we made a huge number of hits of code. So in the end, you see how, how much we have in the end. We have this uh, red line quite low, but green line always constantly going up and up and up. This is called hits of code. And if you pay attention to the second URL, so the first URL is the link to my original article, which I published, published uh, seven years ago. And the second one is the web service, which was created by some volunteer. It's not mine. It was created by somebody who liked the idea, but not somebody, I know this guy. So he created this web service. You can go to hitsofcode.com, just give your URL of your GitHub repository, and this service will give you a nice badge for your GitHub repository. You can put it on the readme file, and in this readme file, everybody will see how many hits of code you have. Pretty nice. About private repositories, I'm not sure. You can check. You can try. But I think you will need to give access to them because they clone your repository. So in order to this to work, maybe it's only for public, I guess. It's what? It's, it's a badge, yeah. It doesn't show you the graph. No, no, no. It doesn't draw the graph. It's just a badge, which gives you the number. You can go to some of my repositories. For example, this takes, which I mentioned on my GitHub, yegor256 slash takes. In the takes readme, you will see on top, you see the badge, which is about hits of code. I put it in most repositories I work with, this hits of code stuff. It's a very nice service. It's already online for at least, I think, four years for sure, and it keeps running. This is something I told you before. You make something funny, you make some pet project, you put it online, you forget about it, and people use it and use it and use it, and in a few years, you will have like a really great demonstration of your skills. So I'm sure right now this guy can easily show it to any employer and say, look, I'm the maker of this. Look how many repositories actually use my badge, use my service. And uh, that's, that will give him uh, higher chances to be, fi to be hired, not fired. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I misspoke a little bit. But maybe also chances to get fired as well, because if you spend too much time on your pet projects, then yeah, you may get fired. How about it? How, how, can you make such a graph? how can you make such a graph? For this graph, I used, uh, you know, I made it seven years ago. So uh, probably I used something like, that's a good question. What did I do to, to draw this graph? Oh, sorry. I, I have a tool. I have a command line tool, which is called Hawk. Sorry about that. I forgot. Yeah, it's called Hawk. H-O-C on my, on my GitHub. H-O-C. Exactly. You can you can print the graph and do whatever you want. Okay. So they always expect that the branch is master. Yeah. Maybe you can configure the name of the branch in the, in, the, in the URL. If not, the repository is open source. This hits of code is open source. Submit a ticket or maybe even make a, make, a, make a pull request and they will accept it. Think about it, yeah. But at least a ticket, at least make an issue there. And they, will, they, will, they, will, they will pay attention. So that's the second metric for you to pay attention to. Another one, second one, which measures the complexity of the code. Who ever heard about cyclomatic complexity? You don't know. This is number one. Number one metric which, which actually is extremely old, 76. You know, I was born in this year, but they already introduced uh, the metric at that time. So the metric will look at your code and they will say how complex it is. The, basically, this, this metric measures the complexity of one method, of one function. So it was invented before object-oriented programming. So we're talking about function, the procedure, the some, some piece of structured core code where you have, uh, you know, diversions and everything. Can you open right now, who has the computer, can you open any of your code right now, like any simple piece of your code which you write, and uh, find some function, which is not huge, like 10 lines of code, maybe about around 10 lines of code, very small, find it out. And now let's try to calculate this metric this McCabe, McCabe complexity, cyclomatic complexity. The formula is this. You, first of all, you calculate, you, you imagine that you, using your method, using your structure, the structured code, you draw a graph. In the graph, you put all the forks and branches as lines and statements as circles, as vertices. So for example, you say, uh, print hello, 
this is the, the, the circle. Then you go down. Then you say, if something is something. Then you put the circle and two lines like this. From this, if you go left or right. So you have two statements here. And then you go from there, from there. So your basically execution will look like a graph, which starts from here and gets to the end point. Sometimes it will exit here. Maybe you have return statements or, or uh, throw exceptions somewhere. So you need to calculate for this metric. You need to, first of all, calculate how many edges you have. Then you calculate how many nodes you have. And then you calculate how many entry and exit, po exit points you have. The entry point is always one, but then it may exit at uh, return statement here and there. So if you, so? Now, that is so say again? Which language? Which language do you use? C sharp. So it's like a functional programming in your case. So there are no ish. Uh -huh. So you have no like statement, statement, statement. Yeah. No, I have a, a function call, a function call, a chain of function calls. Chain of function calls. Then in this case, you have many like uh, nodes. And just verges going like next, 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 next. So you don't have forks. So you don't fork. Basically, this metric is paying attention to how many forks you have. So if your code looks like print hello, print goodbye, print, 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 then in this case, you're going to have the number of edges on the graph will be one, two, three, four, five. And the number of nodes will be one, two, three, four, five. So you will go just vertically like this. And the complexity will just grow by the number of, uh, no, it, the complexity will not grow. So look what happens. You calculate the number of edges, and then you calculate the number of nodes. So if your code is just flow of instructions, then the formula will say E minus N, so it's going to be zero. And then plus entry and exit point, plus two, and that's it. So your complexity will always be stable, the same, close to zero, if your flow is like this. I think they don't count uh, separate statements, but they count the basic blocks. So what you have between the branches. No, no, they count, they, they really count the statements and they count the lines between statements. That's how it's usually, like how it works in the, in the calculator for Java, for example. But how would this work for a uh, recursive function? <laughs> they don't pay attention on how you execute. The question is about recursion. They don't pay attention on how your code being executed. They only pay attention how it's written. The static, yeah, they, they, they pay attention to static structure of the code. They don't pay attention to control flow graph or how it works, if you go left and right. No, you just look at how you write it. And, and, and then the statements just, basically they pay attention to if, then, else, like how much you indent your code to the right side. So the more, the more you indent the code, the more nesting you see in the code, the higher the complexity. This is basically what the function is about. And the for loop can be considered as any branches? For loop is just, is just, is just one, one, one nesting. For and then the block of the code just goes inside of the, the for. So I, I think the for loop is not going to increase your complexity by just one. So it doesn't matter how many times you, you loop, you just... So play with it. I mean, I think in all languages, in most languages, they have tools to calculate this complexity, cyclomatic complexity, and many static analyzers will complain if your, if your cyclomatic complexity goes too high. So for example, uh, PMD will complain if it's above 10 or something. So if, num if, if the complexity of the method is higher than 10, then most static analyzers, PMD, for example, for Java, it will complain and say that something is wrong, so your method is very complex. So, and then people pay attention to this metric since then. So it's, it's on the market for, for how long? Like uh, 50 years, and we still care about it. Another idea quite, bright, quite new. Actually, I, I made a mistake in the year. It's not 2011, uh, it's 2021. It's just recently, just now. It probably was introduced maybe last year or something. So the idea is very fresh. It's called cognitive complexity. Cognitive complexity is, um, as they say, better than uh, cyclomatic complexity because it pays attention to how you perceive, how your brain understands your code. So they say, we don't really care about don't care much about the complexity of nesting. We care how fast you can understand the code. And they, they took the complexity original metric and they modified it a little. For example, you see on the formula, maybe yeah, you can see it clearly. So on the, on the right side, they, they show how, many we, how much we increment the complexity. 
So they, instead of just using this uh, traditional way, they, they add extra numbers for the nesting. So the more you nest, probably this is the question you asked about for loop. So probably for loop is not gonna, is not gonna introduce as much complexity as they want. So the cognitive complexity makes your complexity, makes the number even higher if the code is not so easy to understand. So usually cognitive complexity is higher than, than, than cyclomatic complexity. Cyclomatic can be quite low, but, but uh, co cognitive complexity will be higher. And again, some static analyzers, they will pay attention to this and they will complain if you're doing it, if you're doing it wrong, if, you, if your complexity is, uh, is wrong. So you need to know about this, it's quite fresh stuff. Cognitive complexity. And actually you can think about making, inventing your own uh, matrix for complexity. Uh, because that's a big question, how can we in general measure the quality of code? That's a huge research question. We, for example, we work on that, like being in real, in real projects when we get the money for that. We ask ourselves, how can we look at one code and say that readability of the code readability, maintainability, basically how can we know that this code is easier to understand than that one? There is no objective metric in the world. So if you say cyclomatic complexity is objective, no, it's not. Because some programmer may say, even though the code is more complex, but I can easily understand comparing to this code. So what to pay attention to? We don't know. There are many, there are many ideas about that, but still we have no, no central metric for maintainability of the code. But that's very important. Why it's very important? Because if you have this metric, if you know how to measure the code objectively, then you can ask the computer, artificial intelligence, to change this code automatically, and the computer will know what is the goal, what to achieve, what to achieve, to decrease the complexity. Now the computer can only be told to decrease cyclomatic complexity, but in very, of, in very many cases, it's not the right goal. So finding the right goal, finding the right metric, that's the subject for future uh, investigation, for future research. We don't know how to do it. So as far as I remember, some uh, of the principles of deep code that are, for example, the non the set of functions that some functions are not very difficult, and that in terms of how much number of lines, or as you said before, an object, or an object uh, Exactly, exactly, yes, 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 yes. These metrics are very, like you said, these metrics don't pay attention to the amount of attributes, they don't pay attention to how many, uh, to how well you name your attributes, maybe your attributes are named ABC, and then my attributes are named file and pass and there's the book, and then it's still gonna be the same cyclomatic complexity. So these metrics are quite limited in, in, in their understanding of the code. How to develop a more advanced metric, we don't know. There are tons of, tons of ideas and still, it's hard to, you know, it's easy to come up with the idea. So if you Google for main code maintainability metric, you will find many articles, many papers who people write about this because it's quite subjective and it's, uh, it seems to be easy to write the paper about it. I mean, you just introduce uh, an interesting idea and say we measure by the lengths of variable names. Long variable names, low readability. Short variable names, high readability, for example. And that's the metric. So you measure many, many, many lines of code, you say we, we test it. The question is how do you validate it? So how can you prove that your metric actually is the same as my personal perception of the code? So your metric will say this code is five, this code is six. But I look at this code, it's gonna be the other, way, the, 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 the other way around. And he looks at this code, it's gonna be some other way around. So how do you test? They usually test like this. They say we asked five people. We called five friends, we showed them five pieces of code, they, they look at it and they said, yes, yes, I agree with what your computer says. That's the proof. But that's obviously not a good proof. So how to prove it really, we don't know. How to measure the validity of the metric. Okay, next topic is coupling and, coupling and cohesion. Coupling and cohesion basically also very, very old concept introduced in the late 1960s by Larry Constantine. Not only him, there were many people who who were thinking in this direction, but he put the label on this, he put the name on that. So he said that low coupling is good and high cohesion is good. What is it and what's the difference? Coupling means how much 
we, how close we stay to each other. For example, in the last lecture you saw we had the class book, which was calling the, 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 the method read online. The book read online. Are they coupled together very much? Because the book knows about read online. The book like, really calls it and knows it by the name. So the coupling is tight. It's called height or tight coupling or, tight cu or high coupling or tight coupling. So they are very, in, like, very much coupled to each other. This is bad. Cohesion means how much coupled are the elements within one module, within one class. For example, we have, two, we have one class and we have two methods. Book, title, give me the title, and author, give me the author. Two methods. Are they connected to each other anyhow? No. Title returns the title, author returns the author. They have no idea about each other. They don't call each other. They don't share anything. They just return just title and the author. In this case, the cohesion is low. So you look at this picture. Coupling means how much we, different modules connected to each other. Cohesion means inside one module, how much they need each other. So cohesion is always about one module. We're talking about one class, one module, one, one package, one something one. And coupling is always, we're talking about different, about uh, a number of modules, different modules, so how much they connected. So they say that cohesion has to be high, so it's good to have a class where everything is connected to each other. So all methods they need, all attributes, all methods call each other, all attributes are shared between all methods and so on and so forth. So having a large class with methods which have nothing to do with each other, it means low cohesion, it's bad. And having multiple classes connected to each other very much without interfaces, but you know, knowing too much about each other, that means uh, tight coupling, which is also a bad idea. Uh, so that's, that's it about cohesion and coupling, I believe. And now the question is, how do we calculate cohesion? Cohesion, like, cohesion means, again, how much in-class elements, methods, attributes, what have you, how they are in need of each other. And there were many metrics introduced, introduced for that. For the coupling, not so many. For cohesion, many metrics. I know at least 30 of them, three zero. 30 metrics which try to calculate cohesion. So you give this a calculator a class, and it says your cohesion is 1.7, something like that. So I will show you four metrics, four, not 30. We're going to talk about four. And uh, again, if you open your class, class, now I need your class, not a, not a function. So open any class you have in any programming language, just, just some class which you like. And let's try to calculate this first metric, which is called LCOM, lack of cohesion of methods. So to calculate this metric, you will need to do a few things. First, you, you, you count M. M is the number of methods in your class. Then you count A. A is the number of attributes in your class. You counting? Any of you? No, not counting. You didn't find the class? You're too ashamed to count? Don't have a computer. It's okay. Okay, then it's no problem. We just go through the metric. And then we count mu which is the amount of methods which use attribute j. So let's say you have five attributes and you have three methods. And then you calculate for each attribute, you see how many methods use this attribute. So they basically are trying to understand, okay, for five attributes, if all three methods, they use each attribute, then it's very good. But if for five methods you have like this method, this attribute is used by three methods, and then these four attributes are only used by one method, then may, maybe something is wrong with the class. So then you, you get these numbers together and you get in the end, you get the formula which can go, uh, which can go quite, uh, let's see, can it be larger than one? Let's take a look. You, you studied math, right? So can it be larger than one? Yeah, I believe it can. Huh? It, 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 it may be, yeah, let's say we have a hundred methods and for a hundred attributes. 
And for each attribute, we have uh, 10 methods, for example. So, so this, this number in the brackets, it, it's the average number of uh, methods which use each attribute. So let's say it's going to be 50. And then with this 50, we divide by 1 divided by, we divide it by 1 minus m. m is the number of, of uh, methods. Let's say we have 10 methods. So we divide it by 1, 1 minus 10, so it's going to be minus, mm, minus, minus 5, and then, so it could be anything. So this metric is not in the, in the, in the range of 0 for, to 1. So it could be any, any number. LCOM can be any number. That's your homework. So open your class, calculate that, and let me know what, what the number. The next metric is called MMAC, method methods through attributes cohesion. They're all making these funny names for them. Uh, so again, we calculate K is the number of methods. Now it's K, not M. L is the number of distinct parameter types. Distinct parameter types. Uh, that means uh, how many, uh, by the parameter they mean uh, for all the methods, let's say you have 10 different methods, and for each method you have some attributes, some, some parameters. So there's parameters, they have different types. There's integer here, string there, float there, and so on and so forth. So here L is going to be the number of distinct parameter types. We look at the whole class and you say, in general, we only use integer, float, and string. Three. So L is going to be three. And then X, uh, X by, the, by the index I, is the number of methods that use type I. So we say, how many methods use integer as their parameter? How many methods use flow, and so on and so forth. And then you apply this formula. And the formula will tell you, are you cohesive enough or not? I took this screenshots from one uh, paper which I wrote some time ago. We, we, we had a project, we still have this project. I, I had this idea many years ago about um, integrating these metrics together, aggregating. There are many of them, like one, two, three, there are 30 of them. And uh, we created a product called JPEG. JPEG is the um, Java library, Java, uh, the product for, in, written in Java for Java code. You give it a number of Java uh, files, of, of compiled Java, cl Java classes, and it calculates the number of metrics. Actually, we implemented 14 different metrics, 14 different metrics for, for each class, and it will give you a nice graph showing what's going on with the each, which each class, like what's the cohesion there. And then we were thinking, is it possible to somehow put these metrics together? Because sometimes one metric says the class is very cohesive, so everything is cool. Another metric says, no, it's not cohesive. And, this, uh, and these indicators are very uh, diverse, and they go in different, diver in the different directions very often. So it's difficult to, uh, to find out what's the real cohesion for a class. And that's why people keep introducing these metrics. And now even people use machine learning for that. So they're trying to use machine learning to, uh, to understand these metrics. Another one is called normalized Hamming distance. Again, I don't... Uh, it's, uh, I mean, interesting name, uh, some Hamming distance, which is uh, something they had before the cohesion. So here we take the L is the number, again, distinct parameters, like before. K is the number of methods. CJ is the number of methods they have the parameter of type J, you know, from a different perspective. So now they, they look at the method and say, okay, which, uh, for, each for each type, how many methods there are. In the previous example, we are looking at how many, the previous one here, yeah, that's how it was. So X, XI was the number of methods they used type I. And now, and this one, number of methods, they have a parameter of type I. I mean, it's the same. It's probably the same. Okay, it's just a different word. All right, my bad. So, but the formula is different. Take a look at this one and this one. Oh, very close, actually, yeah? Maybe it's the same. Yeah, one, they moved one there, now it's two, you see? <laughs> so they changed a little bit, now it's a new metric. Cool, huh? And the last one, which I wanted to share with you, it's the uh, sensitive class cohesion metric. Uh, 
It's the ratio of the summation of connection intensities for all pairs. Connection intensity must be given more weight when such a pair involves more attributes. So connection intensity of all pairs of M methods. Here they pay attention to how, uh, how much uh, connection intensity of all pairs of M methods to the but I'm thinking, what is connected method? M methods are connected. How, how come the method is connected? That's another problem, I guess. That's another question, yeah, to answer. Do you introduce the method of connectivity and make M this one? Yeah, but th that's my question. So how they measure this connectivity? Okay, I don't know. That's for you to find out. How actually this connectivity is measured. So that's... That's the maximum I, would able, I was able to tell you about measuring uh, software design by numbers. So we need to measure, but all we have right now, to my knowledge, is only the ability to look at the size, which is, L, which is uh, lines of code, hits of code, or whatever. And the second is we'll look at the complexity. At the complexity, we can only pay attention to this uh, metrics, which we have like cyclomatic and whatever, and cohesion. Cohesion is uh, easy to measure. We have many formulas, but it's difficult to say which formula is right. If for cyclomatic complexity we have more or less an agreement between everybody what it means, so if you show the code which is complex, then most metrics will agree with you that it is, this code is more complex than this one. For the cohesion, if you show the code for uh, for many, many metrics, then in most cases you will get uh, a different answer. So some of them will say that this class is super cohesive, others, others will say this is extremely low cohesive. Which one is right is difficult to say. But the bottom line is that we as software architects, as designers, we need to try to measure code size and code complexity. And we need to try to manage our project by these metrics no matter how it sounds, because most people will tell you that it's the wrong idea to measure by numbers, by metrics, by size, because they will say, okay, we don't care about size, we don't care about lines of code, we care about features which we deliver to our customers, we care about happy users, we care about market value, we care about innovation, but that's all, uh, that's all wrong, in my opinion. I mean, we can say that, but by saying that, you don't achieve anything. Of course, we need market value. Of course, we need customer satisfaction. Of course, we need uh, happy users. But in order to get there, we need somehow organize and discipline the work of developers. So developers have to be focused on delivering results. And developers, in most cases, are far away from real customers. They're far away from real users, and especially in large, in large companies, in large projects. But not only in large, in small as well. Customer satisfaction depends on so many factors. You will, you will join real projects and you will see how far you will be away from real customers, from real you know, satisfaction of customers. And unless it's a pet project of yours where you're the only developer and you are the only marketing person and you are everything in this project, then yes, you know your customers. But the moment you join real project, a real you know, company, then you will be in the team and there will be 10 other programmers sitting next to you, and there will be marketing people, and there will be product people, and there will be CEO and CTO, and all the people who don't do anything, but they, but they are there. And they talk to real people, talk to customers, and, and the distance between you and real customers will be extremely long. And asking programmers to just focus on customers, that's basically asking them to, to do nothing. So it's better for you if you, for example, happen to become a, a lead of a technical team, then your job is to give your people, give your technical people, the objectives which they understand. And the objective make customers happy is absolutely an understandable objective for technical people. So any normal professional programmer will just immediately understand that the boss is, is having no idea what he's doing, the boss is clueless, and that's a good opportunity to do nothing in this team. If you give if you give these goals to your people, like make customers happy. You need, to, you need to give goals which are measured by numbers. And these numbers have to be under control of developers. And these metrics, which I suggest, that's probably some examples of something which they can control. If I'm a programmer, my boss comes to me and says, we are trying to make a huge breakthrough which will 
penetrate the market and the market will be super happy and we will make a billion dollars. I understand, okay, that's good, so I'm not doing anything here. I'm just getting my salary. But if the boss comes in and says, you know what, next week we are supposed to decrease the cyclomatic complexity of this module by 50%. Clear enough? Absolutely clear. So I know what I need to do. And then I say, how much you pay me for this? If you do it, I give you the bonus of $100. Good, I'm on it. And this is the clear, objective, easy to measure task for me. You see the difference, right, between these two tasks. So most managers which you will work with, they will not be able to give you tasks like this. They will give you, they will give you tasks about market. So your job is to understand who you work for, who is in front of you, and if this is the guy in front of you, then you just spend the next few months or years in this company, get your paycheck, and then find another place. You cannot fight with this. Many people ask me about what to do in this case. So what happens if you join the team and your manager is the manager like this, the manager who is just saying, let's do it together, let's move forward, let's make great, great achievement. So what should you do? In my opinion, you cannot do anything. You cannot change that person. The only thing you can do is try to get yourself some benefit from that, do your open source project, contribute a little bit to this business, but eventually find a better place to work. That's what I can suggest you. But if you become the manager, then remember that your job as a leader of a software team is to take the business goals, understand, okay, they need from us a new product by the end of the year, and this product has to be brilliant, super blah, 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 quality is high, customers are happy. You think, okay, customers are happy means what? Means less bugs. Less bugs means what? Automation of the delivery, higher quality of code, more static analysis, and reduced complexity, and increased cohesion, and increase the number of uh, lines of code which we produce every day. These are the metrics you pay attention to. You put these metrics on the board, and then think, okay, how do I deliver these goals to my people? Can I just tell them, write more lines of code every day? Maybe you can, if, like I told you, your build, your continuous integration, your delivery system is strong enough to reject the, the garbage. Then you say, okay, starting today, we calculate how many lines of code each of you write every day. You write 10, you write 50, you write 100. Who writes the most by the end of the week gets $100. Boom. That's how you motivate your entire team. And then they start moving faster. But remember, of course, if you, have, if you are strong enough to reject the garbage. Because if you're not strong enough, if your system is not strong enough, they will get, then it's going to get ugly. And the same for complexity. You say, look at our code. The complexity is too high. We know that I know that my customers have to be happy. I'm not telling you this. You don't worry about the customers. This is my pain how to make customers happy. I'm the manager. So I know my job is to make customers happy. I decompose this problem to you. And for each of you, I want the complexity to go down. For you as a manager, the technical manager, the designer of the team, your job is to identify the metrics which you're going to use to manage your people. And this is very difficult, very difficult. In most cases, people will, give, will, will argue with you. They will say it's a bad metric. We don't like it. It's lines of code. They will show you the quote by Bill Gates that only stupid managers pay attention to lines of code. They will tell you everything you can hear, like all they will fight against you. But you need to convince them to introduce really interesting, good metrics, convince them that these metrics make sense. Make sense. We will talk about the metrics after the break. Productivity and its metrics. Productivity is another dimension to measure what's going on in the design world. And I will show you Productivity is basically how much you as a developer, as a designer, produce for the project. So if I am your boss, if I am the lead architect, if I am the chief designer and you are the developer, then I want to measure your productivity. Again, again, many people will tell you that's a bad idea to measure productivity. Just let people work and they will create the best result. But in reality, it's not happening. In reality, the majority of people are lazy. Not only lazy, but not motivated. Not only not motivated, but just don't know what to do. So we need to give them objectives. We need to tell them, this is how you perform. This is how you perform. This is how you're doing. And that, using this information, they will do better. So productivity metrics. This is how I suggest to measure the productivity of a programmer. Number one, features delivered. Let's say we have features in the backlog. I give you features. You deliver. You close the, the ticket. You implement the features. 
you put them into, into, into repository, features go to customers, we say one feature done, another feature done, another feature done. We can use Scrum for that, we can use this backlog, we can use Kanban, we can use different management, different management frameworks. The more features you deliver, the better. You delivered five last month, you delivered three last month, so you get the bonus, you don't get the bonus, that's it. Second one, pull requests merge. This is my favorite one. This is how I would actually measure all programmers in the world. You submit the changes to us in the repository, we merge your changes in, you get the checkbox. We merge, you get okay. Of course, we're gonna try to reject your code. Of course, we're gonna try to push it back. Of course, we will try to, uh, to prove to you that your code is not good. This is our job, this is our quality control. So we control the quality by rejecting the code that you submit to us. Rejecting, not accepting, but rejecting. This is the, the job of a quality control. Your job is to get through and push it through and make sure it's merged. The more people merge by the end of the month is the better programmer. If you merge more than him, then you are the better programmer. That's it, simple as that. Another one, bugs fixed. We can also check this, measure the performance, the productivity by that. Not only by merge request, but actually bugs fixed. Because actually one bug very often needs a number of pull requests. So let's say it's a big bug. We say the bug, the cost of the bug is like 10 points. In order to fix this bug, you will make five pull requests. You will make changes, changes, changes. We're gonna merge your stuff, merge, merge, merge. And in the end, you fix the bug. Every time the bug is fixed, we give you the checkbox. And the, the, who confirms that the bug is fixed? The person who reported the bug. So each bug has a reporter. The reporter says something is broken. You fix that problem. The reporter says, done. You get the points. That's that. Another one, bugs reported. That's also an interesting metric for programmers. The more bugs you report, the better, the more points you get. So each bug being reported means that you are a good programmer. Actually, reporting bug, it's another, you know, it's another art, another, you know, Another, another job which, is, which you need to learn how to do because most programmers, they don't know how to report bugs. It's not so easy. Try to go to some open source repository, a big open source repository, and create a ticket there if something is broken. You will see how many questions they will ask you. They will see how they complain about your report. They will close your tickets. Try to ask a question on Stack Overflow. That's a very similar to bugs reporting. So something is, who of you actually have accounts on Stack Overflow? One, two, three. Oh, that's amazing. Well, most of you. So when I ask the same question for, you know, programmers who are 10 years experience, most of them say no. Like, you'll be surprised. Most of them say, no, 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 we don't need accounts there. We don't ask questions there because all questions are answered, they say. They say all questions are answered. I ask questions on Stack Overflow every day for the last 10 years. I asked one this morning and then deleted it because I understood that I asked the wrong thing. But, but I got some answers, so they, they, they pushed me to the right direction, then I deleted the question. But anyway, so I ask the questions there almost every day. That's how I use Stack Overflow for 10 years. And I'm a programmer with, I mean, I'm, pro I'm writing code for, I don't know, maybe 25 years or more. So when people say, I don't need a count on Stack Overflow because all questions are asked, it means that they're either not doing anything, they don't write code, or they're just doing, they're solving very simple problems. So they work on something which is extremely simple, which, you know, anybody can work on. So if you work on something which is, which is new, which nobody have done before, then you obviously need an account in Stack Overflow. So my point to you, probably I said it in, in uh, one of the lect lectures before, if you think yourself as a good programmer, as a professional programmer, you have to grow your reputation in Stack Overflow. Just grow your reputation by asking questions and giving answers. As, uh, questions and answers. Answers is like a hobby, so if you have time, you just spend a few, I don't know, maybe a few hours a day or one hour a day just to answer the questions people ask. That will really entertain you. You will see how difficult it is to, to give the right answer. And asking questions is what you need for, for your work. So bug reported. We usually, I usually suggest to give points to programmers when they report bugs. You report a bug, you get a point. Yeah. There will be hundreds of them for each category that you design for them. Who will do the documentation? Who will give, okay, this bug worth one point, this bug worth nine points. There will be tons of documentation. 
Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, yeah, I'm giving you metrics, and the question is who's going to collect the numbers, right? If it's a large repository, people report, people fix, people merge. Uh, you can write a, a robot, a collecting, you know, a robot collecting metrics. Well, I wrote a number of them before, and we use them. It's not so difficult. GitHub API is open, so you can just write a small software, small script, which will go to GitHub API and collect the statistics. It's not so difficult. We have it in our team, the statistics collector. I made a number of robots before. So it's, it's not going to be difficult because any ticket tracking system, they have, it has an open API. And through this API, you can collect all the numbers. You know, how, you know, how many points? How many points to give? Oh, okay, you mean what's the rules? How to define the rules? How many points for this bug? How many? Oh, that's a separate question. So how do you define the rules? Like how many points you give for the bug reported? How many points for the pull request merge? Yeah, so how do you balance these points? Well, that's up to you to design in the team. You sit together with the team and say, okay, guys, how do you think, what is more difficult to do, to submit a pull request and merge it or to report a bug? Probably it's, I don't know, five to four, I don't know, five points for this, four points for that, and then start working. And then in a few months, you will see what's going on. You will see that people start complaining. They will say, look, I spent so much time on making pull requests and merging my code, and you guys just report bugs, which is easy. So uh, well, how about you, we give you less points? And they will say, no, it's not so easy, it's difficult, and so on and so forth. So you will argue a little bit about the rules, then you set up the rules in your team, and then you continue working. So rules, you change them, you change them, you improve them, they, they have to be uh, live rules, so they have to evaluate over time. But you need these rules, and these rules will help everybody to be more productive. The productivity will grow if you and not only managed by emotions, like, hey, it's a great programmer because we all love him. No, he's a great programmer because he's got more points. And how more points? Because more bugs reported, more pull requests merged, and so on and so forth. Are there some tools that help uh, to manage all these things, something like uh, Jira, for example? There are some tools which can help you manage that. I am the author of one of these tools, and I'm sure that there will be more tools in the world to appear like, appear like that. Uh, you can... Send me a message in Telegram and I will show you some tools which I know. They exist. Open source, not open source. Uh, another metric which uh, I would suggest, release published. Release published. So when something is ready, when the product is ready, when we really to release version number 0.5.6, then we give some points to people who release it. Because each release, it's a time-consuming operation. So releasing the software, it, it takes time. So I suggest, again, we can give points for this for this uh, thing. Uptime, that's a very interesting metric. So if, for example, I'm the architect, so I'm not really, uh, in, well, in a good team, the architect writes code and the architect also report bugs, but let's say we have a team with the architect who doesn't do this and the architect is just a lazy guy who just observes what's going on. In this case, we can still measure the performance, the productivity of this guy by the uptime of our system. Like if the uptime over the last 30 days was over 99.99, .99, it means that the system was down for less than five minutes, for example, then we give points to the architect. If the uptime was less than 99.9, .9, then we, for example, deduct some points from the architect. And then based on these points, we're gonna give annual bonus or we're gonna not give annual bonus and so on and so forth. So uptime is a good metric maybe for a team as well. So you can say, okay guys, all of you work together, you want to get the bonus by the end of the year, I understand that. We're not going to give you the bonus because you're good guys. We're going to give you the bonus because uptime is over 99.99. Cool. Everybody's cool. Keep working on that. In this case, the team is focused on making the system more stable. And finally, the metric which I also like, it's called cost, cost of pull request. Some people, and I've seen that many times, when they know that they get um, the points for the pull request, they... I mean, okay, forget about these people for now, but let's talk about what it is, cost of, cost of pull request. Cost of pull request means how much time we spend to review your pull request. So you submit the pull request, but in order to review your pull request and accept it, we spend five days for your pull request. But for his pull request, we spend one day on average. So all of your pull requests, for example, five days for us, all of his pull requests is one day for us because he submits the code which is already better prepared for us to accept. So you cost us more than he. And in this case, you get less points, he gets more points. So less expensive pull requests, they have to get more points. 
How do we calculate the cost of pull request? Any ideas? Like by looking at the pull request, how can we say what was the cost? Number of lines changed. Number of lines. No, no, I mean the cost of pull request for us. You changed 100 lines. But then we spend three days to review your lines, to give you comments, to reply to your comments. Then we suggested to change something. You change it. Then you come back to us again, back and forth, back and forth. And in the end, we said, OK, we like it. And we accept it. So how to calculate this cost of communication? Number of revisions. Number of revisions, number of com comments, yeah. So the more comments we see there, the more expensive was the pull request. And the expensive pull request is not good. It means that you wasted our time on your changes. It's better to send us something which we just love and accept. And that leads us to conclusion that a good programmer would always try to write smaller pull requests. So it's just a good practice in general for us as reviewers, for you as a programmer, to make pull requests smaller. The larger are your pull requests, the lower is the quality of you, of you as a programmer of your pull requests in general. So try to make your pull requests short. And actually there was some research probably last year by Google where they said, there was an article published, where they said that uh, smaller pull requests, they get merged faster and they get into production faster. And that's like obvious. You don't need to research for that. It's like you can understand what's going on. I mean, I know people who are arguing with that, who said, no, it's not true, that actually large pull requests are better because when the pull request is large, then there you see everything. So you see all necessary changes, and that's better. When the pull request is small, you only see a fraction of changes, and you need to understand how this fraction actually affects everything else, and then the decision whether to merge or not merge is difficult to make. So it's much easier to make a decision when everything is present in the pull request. But that's not, it is true. I mean, there is some logic in that, but overall, it's still better to make requests smaller because they get merged faster. And now if you look at this matrix, and the last one, okay, the last metric, which is the result of your mentee. Um, we, uh, I suggest in, in a team to uh, always to try to have uh, the hierarchy of, of metrics. So when you earn something, well, that's what we did in a number of teams many, many times. When somebody joins the team, it's a new, new member of the team, we always assign a mentor. And we say, you are the mentor of him. So he just joined us for a few days ago. So you're going to be his mentor for the next three months. And when he makes points, we give you some percentage of these points. So you will be interested in the results of your students. So we have like students in the team. That's how, that's how I would suggest to, to do for, for most teams. Because young, I mean, people who new join, and, and any team will have such people. Because people come and go, you know that. Uh, so you need to somehow you know, train people. And instead of training, you just say, okay, he's the mentor, you're the student, so get together. The more the student makes, the more the mentor also earns. So these are productivity metrics, which I suggest to use. You can invent your own. Actually, there's a link to the blog post where I suggested that, so try it out. Maybe you can, uh, no, it's a link, sorry. It's a link to the, <laughs> it's something else. It's a link to the podcast where I was uh, uh, interviewing um, very, famous guy who is the, who is the uh, in general, a big fan of no productivity concepts. So in this podcast, you can hear how we discuss this, this, this paradigm. And he says there that productivity is in general uh, a bad idea. So you don't ask programmers to be productive. You just let them, let them go without any metrics. So here, like, listen up. It's on, it's on YouTube. You will, you will enjoy the conversation. Um, Another thing which I wanted to talk to you about as a, as a designer, so you are the designers, the future designers, this is something you definitely need to know, it's the soft skills. So soft skills, yeah, it's a very trendy, trendy uh, concept, soft skills, so people believe that soft skills is like uh, you need to be a nice guy, I need to love people who work with you, but I believe it's something more to that. It's basically not, not, more, not only about it, or maybe absolutely not about this. I believe that soft skills, is, soft skills are about a few things. First of all, these are the skills which you need on top of writing code. And these skills will really help you to be more productive, more effective software engineers and software designers. First of all, it's the ability to draw, drawing skills. We discussed that a few lectures ago. UML is one of the instruments you use. So UML, in most cases, it's going to be your, your, your instrument of drawing. So how you can draw what you have in your mind, the better you can do that, the easier your ideas will get to production, the more effective you will be. So learn that skill, train that. 
draw diagrams, present diagrams, not only code, but diagrams. Another one is writing. So practice in writing. I mean, writing tickets, writing questions in Stack Overflow, writing readme documentation, writing uh, documentation with uh, comments inside your code, not inside the body of the method, of the method, but write documentation for your classes, for your method. So learn how to write, technical writing. People who are good technical writers, they're way more effective than just programmers. So you need to know how to write. And the best way to practice your writing, I said it many times, is Stack Overflow. Because in Stack Overflow, you will be completely bashed for your low quality of writing. Nobody have no mercy there. So if you write something bad, they will just delete you. They will not even think about your feelings about that. They will never think about who you are. They just delete you. They will just block you, ban you. That's it. So it's a very aggressive environment, which is good, which trains you. So if you grow your reputation on Stack Overflow for 10,000, then you will be absolutely immortal for your future teams. So nobody will be able to compete with you. You will be able to write great documentation, all the tickets, everything will be absolutely cool. And you have time for that. You're a student now. So spend the next two years to grow your reputation from zero to 10,000. That's it. You're untouchable. I mean, one year will be enough. Next one, reporting. How can you, I mean, it's close to writing. So how can you report bugs? And actually, reporting bugs is not only explaining the bug, but also finding the right way to report it. So when you report the bug, you need to put the right links to the where the bugs was found. You need to attach the log of your, you know, the logs of how the error was, was happening. We need to, you need to do many things. What I suggest you to try, in how to practice this, I suggest you take some open source project, open one, which is young, and just try to play with the product. And of course, it will be not, it will not work as expected. Of course, you will have issues. And then you will have to report these issues. Try to report them and see the reaction of the team. If the team will accept that, that's great. If the team will complain about the quality of reporting, then you have problems. You need to learn and improve. You can try some of my open source projects. We have a few projects right now in active development. You just take them, play with that, report some bugs, make yourself a goal, like I report a few bugs every week. That's how you become a a community member, because people will start knowing you, they will see that you contribute, you report bugs, they will care more and more about you, and then eventually you can become a contributor, you can start writing code there as well. That's how you join an open source community, I believe. The, the best way to join is by reporting bugs. Next one is branching. So if you work in one branch, master branch, and you never make uh, feature branches and everything, I mean Git branches, then you're not a professional developer. Again, I know many people who claim to be super duper seasoned senior developers and then say, I don't like Git. I just write code, which is absolutely, absolutely great. I will send you the code by in file, in archive. I'll just make a zip file to you. This is my code. I know many of them. Most of them are quite old. How do they work in they, they, this is how they work. They just write code and send zip file to, to their friends and they say, I don't like Git. I don't understand Git. I don't know how it works. I don't understand these branches and everything. Who of you don't understand Git? I mean, nobody gonna raise your hand, right? Okay, who knows how Git works? Okay, all right, more or less, yeah? You actually... I did it on this sound files from the program repository, which is, which is huge. Uh -huh. And I made a project basically that just uh, looks up a specific files and specific comments without checking, checking it out. Mm -hmm. So just learn it. I mean, before Git, we had sub Subversion, which was probably nobody of you remembers that. Subversion, that was a probably disappeared from the market like eight years ago or something, and then Git replaced it. So Git is just number one. Uh, learning Git is just a matter of reading a book of that size. I mean, it's like 100 pages. It's not so difficult. And then practice that. Just practice. Even when you work with your own repository, where you are the only developer, still make branches, make pull requests, switch between branches. Do these merge uh, strategies, like try to play with it, like do different things, and, and, and you need to learn how it is. Because not knowing how to branch, how to use Git, that's just, that's just a soft skill which you absolutely uh, need to possess. Asking. 
Well, asking, I also put it in the list because actually this, this QR code on the left, it's a blog post where I list many other skills, soft skills, but here I listed a few. Asking is about, uh, it's the same as reporting, but when you report a bug, you report a problem, but asking meaning again. I, I, I sound like a broken record, but again, it's going to stack overflow. Two more, charging. This is probably not, maybe, <laughs> Maybe not so easy to discuss, but you need to learn how to charge money for your work. So you need to be prepared for the market. In the market, after you finish study, you will go to the open market. You will need to charge some money for the, for the works. You need to, to get some money from the employer. And uh, how much you're going to charge, that's the question. My recommendation is to try to play with Upwork. So go to Upwork right now, make an account, say that you charge, I don't know, $10 an hour, $50 an hour up to you and see what people say. Try to close a number of tasks. Try to get a few hundred dollars from them. Just spend the weekend on that. You will feel the market. You will feel how people judge you, how people pay you, how people get angry about your results, how get people happy about the results. You know what I'm talking about, right? Actually, I believe this is the most important part. This is number one, yeah? Charging skills, exactly. So you need to know how to charge. I mean, this is the skill every developer has to have. I know so many developers who have no idea how much they cost, who have no idea how to charge. They just, they just go from company to company and the HR is basically you know, moving them from company to company. And the HR says, this is your salary. And they say, okay, that's, that's all right. And they don't understand taxes. They don't understand the, the market situation. They don't know anything about this. So I suggest you learn that. And the best place right now for you, maybe not a full-time job, but Upwork. Upwork is the good source of extra money. You can spend like one day a week working on, staying on Upwork and you can make a few hundred dollars probably a month or something. Just doing some interesting tasks, which they will do remotely. And the last one is relaxing. So again, this is something programmers, most programmers don't know how to relax. So we get very excited about work. We get very happy about uh, you know, coding, me including myself. And we don't know how to make a vacation, when to relax, how much time to work during the day, how much time to relax. Again, learn it. It's a skill. It's a skill. Because otherwise you will get burned out. You know this problem of burning out. People you know, write blog posts about it these days. They, it, 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 it happens. So if you work too much, then you get burned out. If you work too little, you get poor. So you need to find a balance, like how much you spend, what you work with, what you don't work with. It's a, it's a big question. There has to be some system. You have to design some system for yourself. For example, I start working at this point of time. I always stop like at, I don't know, eight o'clock in the evening. I don't work on these days of the week. I usually spend like my, my Sunday on this. So I don't open the computer during the vacation or I go on vacation like at least once a year for at least this amount of days. So it has to be like system because otherwise, again, I know by myself, otherwise you will just go straight coding and coding and coding. In the end, you may get, you may lose uh, the desire to work. Okay, and now I give you four funny things, four advice, four pieces of advice for you, and then we wrap it up. And that will be the end of this course. I mean, the next lecture will be more philosophical. So one advice which may help you is um, blame the code, not yourself. Two links to two blog posts which you have to read. This is the idea, this is the philosophy. When you open the code, when you start working with the project, or you're already in the project, when something is not clear of what's going on there, you open the class, you open the file, you're trying to fix the bug, but you don't understand how to do it. You don't blame yourself, it's not your fault. It's always a fault of the code base. The code base is not perfect. A good code base has to be absolutely clear to you when you open it up and look at it for five seconds. You open the class, five seconds, ah, I understand what it does, this is how I fix the bug. If this is not happening, it's not your fault. Don't think that you are not a good programmer. It's their fault, the fault of the code base. How do you react in this case? If you don't know how to fix it, you don't understand what's going on there, then you make a ticket. You say, hey, where is the ticket tracking system? Or oh, here it is, new issue. I just opened the file ABC. I have no idea how it works. Where is the goddamn documentation? Submit. That's how you react to problems. 
You never say, oh, I need probably a full day to understand it. Give me a week to, un to understand what's going on. No, 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 that's the wrong attitude. Don't spend a week, spend 15 minutes, 15 seconds, sorry. Just open it up. You don't understand it. Blame the code base, always. So basically, I, I even wrote, uh, and this is the first blog post that says how to be lazy. So try to be lazy, extremely lazy. So you open it up, spend as little time as you can on fixing bugs and implementing features. If you need more time, okay, you just stop and say, this is the problem with the code base, some problem. I make a ticket and somebody will fix it and then I continue. This somebody can be you. So even if the project is yours, even if you're the only developer, have the same mindset in, uh, for, you, for yourself. You always think that I'm temporary here. I always work with the code base temporary. So I open the code base, I look at it, I either fix it immediately or I say, okay, something is not clear. I make a ticket, I stop this task and I make a ticket and then maybe I open this, this new ticket myself and I improve the code base. Then I get back to the original problem. So always blame the code base. That's the philosophy. And, and the, the second blog post is called It's Not a School, <clears throat> which is a very typical problem in software teams where I work. So programmers, they open the code base. For example, it's my code. So I am there for a few years. And then new programmer comes in and, and says, and I give the task, okay, fix me the bug or implement a new feature. And programmer comes to me next day and say, can we have a meeting for an hour? I have interesting questions about your code base. I understand this and this. Okay, I say, okay, let's do the meeting. So I go to the meeting and, and there will be questions. Okay, here's the file. I open the file. Can you please explain me how this file works? And I always say, this is not a school. I'm not interested to teach you how this file works. I'm not interested to making you more smart. I mean, come on, this is, nobody's paying me for this. I want the code base to become better. So this is where I invest my, my, my time. So you say you don't understand it, just say it in the ticket, I will improve the code base and you will understand it. But teaching you, it's a waste of time. Because today it's you, tomorrow it will be another programmer, another, another programmer. So I'll be sitting here teaching new people, teaching new people, teaching, explaining again and again how my file works. And the file will remain bad. So it's an improperly documented file and I'm here to, to train people how to use it. It's wrong. It's completely wa complete waste of resources. Instead, you just say, I don't understand this, 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 and that. I will fix everything. And then you take a look at it again. You take a look and say, oh, now it's better. I still have questions for here, for here, for here. Again, report the ticket. I again fix the ticket. But no direct education for you. So never teach programmers. Never teach them how, to, how the code works. Never teach them, never, never give them any knowledge about the system. Knowledge has to be inside the system. If the knowledge is not there, the problem is right there. Not, not the direct, uh, the, the direct teaching is not gonna help. It's not gonna solve the problem. That's my first point. The second one, also interesting advice for you, for the future, aim for speed, not for quality. The idea is simple. Programmers, you in a team, let's say you are the manager of the team, you're the team leader of the, of the group of programmers, don't ask them to write high quality code. Instead, say, I don't care the quality you write. Write bad code, is okay. Write whatever you like, but make it fast. So I only care how many, many pieces of code you deliver to me. I only care about speed. I only will count how many pull requests I merge. So my concern is quality. I will care about quality. I will check the quality. I will not accept what is low quality. This is my, I mean, I have a gate here. I have the door and the door is locked. And I want you to knock at this door many times a day. And I don't care what kind of quality you bring because I will not accept low quality. So I will not tell you, please care about quality. Let's sit together. Let's discuss. It's very important to write high quality code. I don't care about that. I just say, make it fast. And then it's going to be your problem how to make high quality so that I accept it. So that's the philosophy. So I care about quality. I means the, the project. I mean, if I'm the architect, if, if I'm the, the chief designer. And programmers, I only tell them fast, 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 deliver faster, more pull requests, more bugs, more fixes, more features. Quality, I don't care. But really, I care. But I'm not telling you this. I care, but I care I build the technology which blocks your low quality. But I'm, in most cases, I'm not even telling you about this. 
I just improved the quality control. I put extra static analyzers. I put extra checks, extra linters. I built like a wall, which is larger and larger and larger and difficult to get through. And you keep trying to push through. You keep trying to deliver faster and faster and faster. And in this conflict, you want to deliver faster to get your points, to get your bonuses. And I build the wall higher and higher, more and more difficult to penetrate. And in this conflict, we get the best quality with the best speed. So when people talk about quality, like, you know, talk in the team and discuss like, hey, please, we need more, like, like why your code is of low quality? Please pay more attention. Know that this is the wrong, you must understand that this is the wrong manager. If the manager talks to you about, about how low quality is your code. The manager has to be busy building the wall, rejecting your quality, rejecting your code, not talking to you about quality. We have two more meetings. I am a big, yeah, yeah, I'm a big advocate of no meetings environment. So every meeting, it's not only me saying that, the full internet, the internet is full of, of, of these messages. So each meeting is a waste of time. If you can avoid meetings, especially technical meetings, it's only good for the team. Because first, the first reason is that meeting is a, is a synchronized event. It's synchronous, synchronous event. You, me, everybody else, we need to sit together, stop doing what we were doing before, and listen to each other. So we block everybody. And here, okay, you're a student, so you have nothing else to do. You have to be at this lecture. It's okay. I'm kidding. But in the real company, imagine five people. Each of them is doing something. So they are working and writing some code. And then I'm the manager, and I say, hey, everybody, get together in the room. We're going to discuss an interesting problem he's working on. Everybody like, okay, let's get to the room. And then we talk about the problem. The other four people, we just check Facebook. Because it's impossible to imagine the problem where everybody has to be involved. And in most cases, meetings are just, you know, just blocking everybody, while only two people or three people maybe need to talk. But in most cases, even these two people, three people don't need to talk. We only need to explain ourselves the ideas on paper, explain in the documentation. I ask you, Make, an, make a proposal how you would like to design this system. You make a proposal in UML, in the documentation. I read it in my, on my bed, you know, lying in the bed, watching the, the TV series, reading the documentation. I don't need any meetings for that. I just read it. I make my comments. I send it back to you. Tomorrow morning, you wake up at 6 o'clock because it's more convenient for you. You read the, my answers. You answer back. That's how we communicate in technical documentation. Meetings in general are a terrible idea. So if you join the team where you have many meetings, when people meet like every day, then you must understand that something is wrong with the team. Most probably the management is broken. Most probably the manager just doesn't know how to manage you without meetings. So the best the manager can do is call everybody in the room and start asking, okay, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Because he or she doesn't know how to collect this information from you and how to exchange information in writing, in documentation. They just don't have the skill. So no meetings in your professional life. Stay away from meetings. Do it on paper. Do it in the documentation. And the final advice. What about Scrum meetings? Yes, yeah, Scrum meetings is even worse. So Scrum meeting is the last line. Yeah, it's called morning stand-ups meet, stand-up meetings. Just read the blog post. It says it's a completely wrong idea, morning stand-ups. This is even worse than technical meetings. Well, it's, don't get me started. Get the, get the blog post. We don't have time for that. So we have two more minutes. Let's finish, finish it up. Um, the final line is work for the product, not for the boss. Very often software engineers, they, they try to make their boss happy. They try to please the boss. I even have this, um, the, 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 the last blog post is called, it's called haircut. So the blog post is about me getting a haircut. It happened in California. I went to the barber shop, to the, to, the, to the hairdresser, and then I asked them, I mean, do the haircut. And he was always asking me, do you, do you want it this way? How do you want it? Do you want it this? Do you want this? Like, can I cut you from the left? Can I so he was always asking me, how do I want it? And he was trying to make me happy. I mean, asking the questions, asking what exactly do you want? Instead, I, tell, I told him, look, I don't want you to make me happy. I want you to make a good haircut. So I just trust you as a, ha as a hairdresser that you know how to make the haircut. When you make it, I will be happy, but not the other way around. So don't make me happy. Make the good haircut. 
but he was trying to make just make me happy and the haircut is something secondary. The same for software developers. So don't try to make the software which is, which makes, which is what the customer wants. Make the software you believe is right and then the customer will be happy. In very often customers don't know what they want. Many, very often customers have no idea what is better, Java or C Sharp. So if you ask him, do you want Java? And he will say, no, you know, my neighbor likes C Sharp, so I probably like C Sharp. And you say, okay, sure, I will make you happy. You'll make C Sharp. No, you just come and say, you know what, it's going to be Python, because I believe Python is the right choice for this product. And he will say, but my neighbor likes C Sharp. You say, yeah, I know, but I don't care. I want the good product to make. I want it to be in the right technology. The right technology in my mind is Python, so I do it in Python. And in the end, when you make the product, the customer will say, oh, you were right, you're a professional developer because you made the right choice. So you don't listen to, you don't, I mean, you listen to customers, but you take their opinion as an opinion. Like the hair, like the haircut. You come to the hair, to the hairdresser, you, like they, they ask you, okay, how do I want it? And I say, I want it nice. I want it shorter than now, that's it. And then they make it the way they want it, like being professional, you know, this hairdresser. And then I say, oh, I like it. I will come to you back again because I like how you do haircut. But don't ask me how I want it. The same for software engineers. Read the blog posts. Hopefully you find it interesting. Okay, now a few books. Actually, these two books. Finally, I will suggest you my book. Um, I wrote this book uh, two years ago called The Head. Actually, it uh, says many things about what we mentioned today. And this book on the left is absolutely brilliant book, which I recommend to everybody, which is about project management. It says PMP exam, but it's not really, uh, I mean, don't worry about the exam being an exam. It's actually a book about management. I believe the best book about management you can ever find anywhere on the internet. So if you read that, you will definitely be a great manager. That's the book I recommend. What to do next? Again, the conference, maybe this one. I, uh, this one, if you, if you really care about metrics of software development, then this is the number one conference on software metrics and software engineering. So this is where people publish all the different metrics they can invent. So if you, if you invent your own metric, then go there. Call to action, what you can do is you can configure, for example, automated collection of cohesion and other metrics in your project and publi publish the numbers on each build. Try it out. Try to collect some metrics in your project, in your automated build, and publish them. And finally, the questions we have. The question number one, I told you about it already, how to measure code readability. Nobody knows. Maybe you will find out in the next 10 years. Go and publish. Next one, how to connect management and software metrics. Again, the problem. People know that there are metrics, but most managers right now will tell you, no, there is no connection. We don't manage by metrics. I believe we have to. The question is how. Question number three is how to balance different metrics. Like with the example with cohesion metrics. Some metrics say go this direction, other metrics has say this direction. So how to balance? That's a very big open research question. And finally, how to predict the future using metrics. This is many software teams or many research teams are working on this right now. So if you look at the metrics in a software project, you collect the numbers, and then the question is what's gonna happen with the project in three months? Will it fail? Or will it succeed? Will people quit because they are unhappy? Or they will stay? Will the customer be happy? Will we get extra money? Will we get extra funding? Or we will fail? What we have now is just numbers. So we have a research project within the Polish University with the professors from here, which do exactly the same. So we're trying to find out how the numbers, how the metrics can predict the future. That's exactly the answer we're trying to answer. We spend money on this. We're trying to find out how to do it. And there are many teams in the world, research teams, are trying to answer this question because it's so easy to collect metrics, but it's so difficult to predict the future. So we can connect one to another. You can join, you, you have the opportunity to, to, to be in research teams doing this.